It is the early 1970s, and for one of the first times an end may be in sight. Since 1955, war has raged in Vietnam. The blood of many different countrymen spanning the globe have been shed in this foreign land. And for one soldier, whose two years of service may finally be drawing to a close. Stephen Chassie, born February 27, 1945, has been waiting for his trip home. He remembers his cozy town of Brockton, Massachusetts, along with his family. But he also remembers a place distant from his home. A place he has been dreaming of since he was a child. Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Like many soldiers who came home from the war, a parade was the furthest thing Chassis would see. For him, it didn't matter. He came back home to Brockton, Massachusetts with his medals of bravery humbly. He had his idea of what he wanted to do next, and set out to do it. By 1975, Steve departed his northeast home and moved to the Hoosier state of Indiana. There, Steve began getting things put together to start running the USAC Silver Crown Series. He ran four out of five races in 1975, claiming a best finish of sixth. He was driving car number 87 for himself, but for 1976, he ran twice, finishing ninth after starting third at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. Steve again ran 1977 and had modest results, trying to build up his racing career the best he could. Finally, in 1979, he got an opportunity to run a better car, driving the number 15 for an unknown owner. At the Illinois State Fairgrounds, Steve won the pole and led 78 laps before falling back and giving up the win to Bobby Olivero. Steve then went to DuCoin for the Ted Horn 100 and battled Bill Vukovic Jr., to which again, Steve would have a fuel issue and fall out. The last race of the year was at the Indiana State Fairgrounds, again for the classic Hoosier 100. Steve again dominated the race, but like in the Tony Bettenhausen 100 at Illinois Fairgrounds, he fell back and Oliveira won again. Steve, though, whilst coming short in the big races, was building a reputation of a hard-nosed driver. He came off as cocky, but it was simply his way of telling you what he thought. It was his no-nonsense style of going about life. Around this time, he and his wife, Gina, had their first son named Blaine, and Steve again went back at it in 1980. He ran six of the eight USAC Silver Crown races that year, coming up short in victory again. He did win a pole at Williams Grove, and finished second again after dominating the 1980 Hoosier 100. Once again, he was outdueled by Gary Bettenhausen. While still winless, Steve got an offer for 1981, one that could finally put him in a position to fulfill his dream. Steve was offered a ride with the Jet Engineering 64 team in CART for 1981. Steve accepted the offer and made his first start at Milwaukee. He blew up on lap 34 and finished 24th. He went to Atlanta for race 3 and 4, and between the two 83 lap races, completed 7 total laps, having 2 mechanical failures in both. In the second race at Atlanta, he actually had to drive a different car, number 75 for Alex Morales. That'd be his only last place finish in 1981. Back-to-back -back engine failures took him out again before running the second race at Milwaukee for Kart, where he finished the race and grabbed his best finish yet, 15th. He then went to Michigan and made it to the end of the race, getting 12th. And finally, in only his second ever road course race, he got 5th at Watkins Glen. Going back earlier in the season, Steve also got his first shot at the Indy 500. But among the long list of drivers trying to make the coveted 33 car field, Steve came up short and his dream would have to wait another year. Steve fell out of card again for 1982. Brand USAC champ car in Silver Crown races. In his Silver Crown runs, he nearly beat Gary Bettenhausen at DuCoin again, and he led a considerable amount of the race to the Hoosier 100 again. For 1983, he got an offer to drive the number 56 Genesee Beer Wagon car. With Eagle chassis and Chevrolet engines, he knew this would be his best shot to try and make the Indianapolis 500. Through the month of May, qualifying set a field of 33 cars like usual. Italian Tio Fabi would win the pole, accompanied by Mike Mosley and Rick Mears on the front row. A little bit further back in the field though, officially starting 19th with the 56, was Steve Chassie. He had finally made the greatest spectacle in auto racing. For many nowadays, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Bump Day has sadly evaporated away, leaving no real qualifying drama to people trying to make the race. But back in the day when nearly 50 men would enter, vying for a chance to run in Indy's hollowed grounds, to be one of the lucky 33 was the ultimate accomplishment. For Steve, 
It was a fulfillment of 15 years of fearless dedication. From the jungles of Vietnam to Gasoline Alley, Steve was finally ready for his first start. He would make it to the finish line unlike 21 others that day, and ultimately take home 11th, beating various legends of the sport who had fallen out due to mechanical issues. On top of making the race, a top 11 was an incredible accomplishment for him, but didn't help him or the team the following season. They DNQ'd half of the races they entered, along with the 500. While his cart wasn't going good for him, in his Silver Crown career, he achieved something he had been so close to capturing for nearly a decade, leading from flag to flag and beating the likes of Ken Schrader, Dave Blaney, Rich Vogler, Jack Hewitt, Gary Bettenhausen, and Sheldon Kinzer. Steve Chassie was your 1984 Who's Your 100 winner. Steve and the Genesee Beer Car made a return for 1985 in cart. The results improved microscopically. Again, the car did not have the 10-mile pace to break through the 33-car threshold at Indy. And 1986 marked only a handful of attempts for the now 41-year-old driver. And after no good options for 1987, it appeared that maybe Steve's top-level open-wheel aspirations had vanished. Steve was a dirt guy that was one of the last attempting to come up through the USAC ranks to reach top American open-wheel racing. Cart had become dominated more and more by road guys who were the furthest thing from the blue-collar dirt scene in America. Many of these drivers were also foreign-born. In 1980, not a single driver in the 33-car field was born outside of America. But by 1987, there were seven foreigners in the 500 field. It was obvious that the times were changing, and Steve was simply another member of the old guard, ready to be pushed out. But Steve wasn't going to go down without a fight. He and his wife, along with car owner Lydia Lorry, scraped together what they could, and with minor exterior help, they got a car for one last shot at Steve's dream. Steve made headlines immediately as May kicked off. His car owner was a woman, a rare situation for the time in motor racing. But Steve was focused. The team was low budget, and not many were experienced on the volunteer crew. Before and after every run, Steve would check over the car, manage the members of the crew, and make sure everything was squared away before practice or qualifying runs were made. As expected though, the team went all the way to May 17th, bump day, with no firm spot in the field. Three spots remained, and the day began with Poncho Carter withdrawing his primary car and requalifying with a backup going faster. Phil Kruger was out soon after and set down an incredible lap one. But going in the one on lap two, he would lose control and smash the wall, destroying his car and leaving the track quiet until quarter to five. Steve was the first one out as shadows drew across the track, but he waved off after three laps to prepare for one last shot. Rocky Morgan went out and set an average of 199 down. Mediocre at best, but in the field nonetheless. After runs by Davy Jones and Dominic Dobson, 33 cars were set. There now was less than 50 minutes until the track closed. George Snyder went out and bumped Rocky Morgan. The speed to get in now was 201.240. Ed Pym and Rick Mishaiaswitz made runs but failed, and now 30 minutes remained. Steve rolled to the end of pit road, and flipped the visor down. He circled around the warm-up lap and knew he had one last chance. But has made some adjustments, come through the line again, and now this is probably, I think, his last chance. I think you're right, the green flag waves and Steve Chassis is on. They will have changed the handling of that car. Of course, once the handling of the car changes to even a little bit worse than what it was, of course, the driver that leads his confidence doesn't want to charge into the apex of the corner because of the 23 or so accidents we had earlier on this month. Uh-oh, Chassis has done it. It's good enough to bump himself into the starting lineup if he can continue at this pace. The first lap is 201.934. The bump speed is 201.240. We have to wait for the second lap because a lot of drivers have picked up speed on the second and third lap. I don't think he made it. The Vietnam veteran and former model here in the Indianapolis area has just taken the green flag to complete lap number two. And there is Dominic Dobson as he sweats it out. And the second lap is a little bit slower, but it is still good enough to bump Dominic Dobson. Lap number two, 201.572. The average 201.7. Remember, he needs to come out of the corner nearly as quickly as he did on the previous lap as Huey Absalom is 
looking on and hoping that his driver can put the uh, speed together. And by golly, the third lap was quicker, Derek. It is above 202 miles an hour. In fact, it's almost 203. Well, that's good because he's just been below the line again at two. So, in fact, he's looking for grip wherever he can find it on the track. If he can maintain this pace, Dominic Dobson receives another set piece. They don't make this race. But that, if things continue the way they have the last three laps, if he's in this range, it will mean that Steve Chassis moves to the bubble. So he bumps, but then stands to be bumped himself. The checkered flag comes out, and Steve Chassis has qualified for this year's 500-mile race. Let's check to see, first of all, if he bumped him. Yes, he did. The fourth lap was his best. Here's Gary. After 30 minutes, Chassis had made it in the field. Car number 33 on the grid. It was time to go racing. And during the pre-race coverage of the 1987 Indy 500, a segment was played featuring Steve's son, Blaine, telling the story of his father's racing career. It was the broadcast's little tribute to the man who had fought through so much just to make the field. Blaine in the segment talked of his father's war medals and his racing career before this moment. Blaine overall showed extreme confidence in his father, as any son would. And after the pre-race ceremonies, he ventured into his second Indy 500. 68 laps would be how long the engine would last, as Steve would fall out and finish 25th. He had worked up to mid-pack, but sadly the shoestring budget couldn't sustain for 500 miles. Steve would come back in 1988 and finish 24th, racing for Gary Trout Motorsports. At the time, he made the field somewhat comfortably, but wrecked out before halfway. Later that year, he and Gary Bettenhausen would battle in the Tony Bettenhausen 100, with Steve coming out on top. After winning the race, Tony Bettenhausen Jr. would hire him to run twice an 89 cart. And once again, he DNQ'd the 500. He took one more stab in it in 1990, but again missed. It was around this time that Steve began to work on a show called Thursday Night Thunder. While still racing in Silver Crown, he helped present the stories of the lower open wheel series, like Rich Vogler's dominance and the rise of Jeff Gordon. Steve would race until 1992, when he finally decided to step away from racing. He was 47 years old and had achieved his dream of racing the Indy 500. He retired to Arizona, where he resides today, now at the age of 77. Of all the drivers who raced Steve over his career, they said the one standalone trait he possessed was his bravery. The ability to stand against the odds of mounting challenges and overcome them. He possessed his bravery on and off the track, and when people would ask Steve what it was that kept him unwavering on the racetrack, he'd reply with, quote, Race cars don't shoot at you. 